This may look like a familiar neighborhood in suburban Kansas City or perhaps Phoenix, but it's not. This is the peaceful community of Ofra, a settlement on the West Bank in Israel. On this program, Tom and I visit Ofra and other settlements to take a closer look at the subject of Zionism, to explore its meaning in these hills of Judea and Samaria. Well, we're uh, here, Zola, at this uh, Jewish settlement north of Jerusalem in the so-called West Bank. Uh, last time we were at uh, Independence Hall and we were talking about Zionism, and here we're seeing the fruits of Zionism uh, all around us. And so close to the neighbors that we clearly hear the Muslim prayer call from the next village on the next hill, which goes off uh, five times a day, including three o'clock in the morning. And the machinery of the uh, building going on behind us in the, in the settlement. It's quite a combination. Like being in Times Square a little bit. <laughs> the last time we were talking about Zionism, the history of Zionism from its earliest stages on up to uh, the, the time of the, through the last war, the big war here in, uh, on Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur War in 73. What about Zionism since then? And uh, especially about the uh, resolution that was passed in the United Nations. Yeah, a, a real indication that the United Nations is a purely political organization. They, they came up with the resolution, Zionism is racism, and as we pointed out at Independence Hall, it's exactly the opposite. This is the only country that takes everybody from everywhere. Uh, racism would be closer to, uh, let's say, an Arab dictatorship, in which if I came and presented a passport, I might be shot down. I, I certainly wouldn't be allowed to simply uh, uh, emigrate uh, and live there. Uh, I, I can't imagine it. Um, quite the other way. I'm afraid Jewish people, such as those that live in Syria, can't come out. They're really prisoners. But not to talk politics, uh, more recently the resolution was uh, finally dropped as part of, uh, I don't know, maybe the American election campaign or whatever. Uh, we, the United States, uh, came to the UN and said it isn't really right, it isn't really fair, and uh, so it was rescinded. And now Zionism is, is not racist, well, it never was. But uh, it has changed in character, too, uh, in its results. That is, it used to be a way of appealing to one or two Jewish people at a time, saying we have a homeland, we need to go back to it, we need to build it. And uh, of course, it worked uh, a dozen at a time and a hundred at a time. But now we have a hundred thousand at a time. We have out of Russia, uh, upwards of 400,000 immigrants have poured in here in the last year or so. And out of Ethiopia, another 40,000 or so. Uh, Jewish people who don't have to be persuaded to come here. The land is already pretty well built and it is a better deal than they have, I, needless to say. Uh, the Maybe Ethiopians, it would be good uh, to <coughs> give our viewers an idea of these distances that people are coming from. Uh, I think you have a map. Okay, that, uh, on the map is striking. Yeah, you uh, can open that out. Uh, Israel is in the middle of this particular map, which is uh, the Middle East from uh, Egypt over to about uh, the end of Iran. Uh, the Soviet Union is up here and of course would go off the map in this direction, but the Jews come from the north, from there, from the south, from Ethiopia down here, uh, from those extremes, and of course from uh, Western Europe and America, always Eastern Europe uh, on a steady stream. This map also serves to show relative sizes. Israel, well I can cover it in, completely with my finger. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, is this. <laughs> Most people just don't realize. Uh, Iraq is this big. Iran isn't even all on the map. It goes out here a little ways off the map. It's enormous. Israel would fit into it, I don't know, 100 times, 50 times. Uh, a very, very small country absorbing an enormous number of people. So Zionism has been, uh, if as it's defined, it's a way to uh, persuade the Jewish people to come back to the land. It's an amazing success. God is, is uh, causing it to work. And perhaps because uh, we really are near the end and in the tribulation, uh, the Lord comes back to find all the uh, uh, Jewish people in Israel. Uh, Paul says uh, when he'll return, uh, all Israel will be saved. Romans 11:26. so evidently all Israel will be here. 
The Antichrist, too, uh, deals with uh, a very Jewish Israel, and, and when he signs the contract, perhaps it makes world Jewry think it's a safe place, and they come back uh, uh, in preference to maybe anti-Semitic outlands, not just like Russia and Ethiopia, but maybe like the United States, maybe like England, maybe like Western Europe of the time. So right now we, we see uh, what's the current population of Israel, including all the immigrants we have so far. Now we have four and a half million Jews, some say five million, and that includes of recent immigrants nearly half a million. And then how many are left in the diaspora? Then there would be just another uh, give or take, uh, four million in Russia, five million in America, a million scattered around Europe somewhere. Nobody has counted these things precisely, but uh, I would say one third of the Jews of the world are now in Israel, approximately a third in America, <laughs> almost you could say a third in New York City, and then uh, another third uh, throughout Asia and Europe. Well, it's uh, all the fulfillment of uh, biblical prophecy uh, that we're seeing here now, the beginnings of the regathering of the dry bones as we discussed uh, in our talk at the Independence Hall and the, the, the vision of the dry bones that Ezekiel had in chapter 37, gathering together, awaiting the ultimate return of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation of Israel and his... Uh, salvation of the sheep Gentiles and uh, the, the establishment of his kingdom upon the earth. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to that. And we've covered a lot of territory. You've come a long way since Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> right, we began with uh, the, the initial promise of the covenant to Abraham and uh, the promise that he gave of the land. And it was- uh, Not at all far from here. <laughs> not far from here. And then it's reconfirmation to Isaac but not to Ishmael. Ishmael would have land outside of the land of Israel in the, the areas of Paran and of course off to the east of the Jordan River. And it was reconfirmed to Jacob, but not to Esau. Esau also would also be on the uh, east side of the river, but to Jacob would go the land and uh, all the, that was promised in the land and the covenant and the hope of the Messiah and the genealogy of the Messiah himself. And then uh, we saw that uh, Jesus testified of all these things and of the future in the Mount of Olives and uh, portrayed the future from his time until his return. And then with the Independence Hall history and this um, survey of modern Israel, we've had a, a remarkable series of uh, Israel by divine right. I think it's uh... It's a point that almost shouldn't have to be made, except that uh, uh, the, the majority of the world does not read the Bible. They don't know the Scripture. No man seeketh after God, the Scripture itself says. Even, even some Jewish people who honor the Scripture in other ways, keeping festivals and so on, take a side of um, um, give the land away, do anything, but let's... Uh, let's get some peace and so on and and uh, gosh we tried to interview all political sides in the uh, program to uh, in the series to let you hear their views but uh, it's necessary to stand here and tell some people God gave the Jews this land and among those are uh, professors at evangelical seminaries uh, writers in Christian magazines somehow these days some kind of movement has developed to say we've got to uh, help with the other side and the Jews uh, uh, are uh, not an important matter in God's plan. I don't know how that ever gets underway in Christianity other than it's not by real Christians or somehow the enemy has gotten hold of them. But it was necessary to make this series and we made it for that purpose. I heard mm, terrible stuff on the radio and reading in uh, magazines like Christianity Today, anti-Israel propaganda out of the mouths of full professors. And it was absolutely necessary to come here, spend this money, make this program, and teach the ABCs of Bible. God gave Israel to Abraham, his friend, and all his seed, the Jewish people, Olam, forever. From the lofty heights of Mount Hermon to the lowest spot on earth, 
From the bustling streets of Jerusalem to the tranquil shores of Galilee. From the crystal clear waters of En Gedi to the stark beauty of an arid wilderness. The Holy Land, a place of fascinating contrast that will enrich your life, historically, spiritually. See the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. For more information, call her right today. Not all settlements are as developed as the one at Ophir. They usually start as little trailer parks, prefabricated single-family dwellings perched high atop a strategic mountain. About five miles north of Jerusalem is a settlement named Anatote, located in the biblical area of Anatote. Not too much has changed since Jeremiah the prophet lived here 2,600 years ago amidst these rocky hills. We pass through this armed gate to visit with an American couple who've moved here and who choose now to call Anatote their home. Uh, Stuart and uh, Joni, I'm glad to uh, have this interview and I really appreciate this. We're sitting in your new house, not, not really finished house, here in the West Bank. And of course, Joni, you've been on the program uh, uh, many times before doing interpretive dance and interviews and so on. And uh, uh, and your new husband, Stuart, uh, glad to have you with us. So here we are in the West Bank. Explain that a little bit for me. Okay, uh, first of all, why do you call it the West Bank? It was only called the West Bank for 19 years, and those 19 years were 19 years of a Jordanian occupation. The Arab Legion, the Jordanian army, stormed across the Jordan River in 1948, and it was only here for 19 years. It's now been under Israeli administration for 25 years, and the Jordan occupation of the land was illegal. Why does everybody keep calling it the West Bank? Hmm. Uh, was it uh, um, because uh, the uh, Arab influence with oil and so on? I, do you suppose? I mean, I can't figure it out to tell you the truth, Zola. I really don't know why the emphasis seems to be on the side of the Arabs, and I really think that it is on the side of the Arabs. Uh, you watch CNN, you g get an American point of view. Of course. And uh, biblically, this is Judea and Samaria, the heartland of Israel, the heartland of the biblical Israel, and in a way the heartland of modern Israel also. Um, our roots as Jews sink very deep into this soil. Mm. Joni, you committed yourself to Israel what, six, seven years ago? Six years ago. And uh, I don't know, you know, from the American point of view, you're, you're uh, uh, on the one hand, in American news today, a troublemaker. A hundred years ago, as a settler, you would have been, in American uh, view, uh, a pioneer. Uh, what's life like out here for the women in the uh, picture? Well, unfortunately, I think you're going to have to ask that question in about another six months to one year because we are not moved in yet. Um, the camera probably doesn't pick it up, but we have a lot of cartons here um, full of boxes. Oh, it's obvious you're just moving in. But, I mean, your, your heart is here already, I suppose. It wasn't easy to, to, to make this move. Are you really, when we drove here just to inform the audience, gosh, we followed winding roads up mountainsides, confronted folks with machine guns. Now, uh, you didn't grow up this way. This was not how you were brought up to live. I think when you make a commitment, and that's the one word that most people are afraid of, but in any type of, of thing, no matter if it's a relationship with God or with a husband or a country or a culture, whatever it is, if you have the word commitment and you follow it, then your heart leads you. And I've made a commitment to Judaism, to Israel, and my heart keeps me here and God willing forever and ever. Although most settlers cite a biblical cause for their stay, we found that there were pragmatic reasons as well. I lived in Jerusalem, I got married, and shortly after I got married, I moved here to Ofra, where uh, I could have um, better, better uh, upbringing for my children. But this is uh, like living in a suburb. A much, uh, much better atmosphere, uh, open air. Don't have to be worried the uh, kids getting, uh, God forbid, run over by a car in the middle of the street. This is a town uh, of about approximately 250 families. People here own their own houses, their own lands. Everybody 
uh, makes his own garden the way he wants, keeps his house the way he wants. It's uh, not like other types of settlement you might have heard about in Israel, like Moshav or Kibbutz, which have some kind of a partnership uh, business or socially between the people. Everybody here lives in his own house, raises his own children. We have schools here from uh, pre-kindergarten till uh, high school. We have a small industry area, we have carpentries, we have here a factory that makes herbal tea, a factory that makes honey. We have a newspaper that's being uh, printed here. At the biblical site of Bethel, Dr. Shabtai Sabato, an orthopedic surgeon, proudly defends his settlement's right to the land. We, we think that the, our connection to the land is from to make it uh, what our fathers wants to continue with that. So we want to continue all this tradition that was uh, my uh, Jacob and Abraham that I mentioned, but all the generation after that, all everyone wants that we will be here in this, this place and to, to set here. That's what our God sent us to, to do, to, to, to be here and to build what's like somebody who is catching his place and not moving from here. So that's part of the motivation for living here is uh, to catch some of the ancient atmosphere of, uh, of the area of Beit El. Yes, uh, you see that all the people here are not are coming only for their convenience. They're coming for all this idea. It's not the idea of to be and to settle in a place that your father was here. We feel it, we feel it. Uh, you can talk in everyone and, and every, every week when we hear about the, the Torah, when we are opening the Torah and we are reading from there, and if Bet El is meaning something and everything that we hear in the name, we are very happy that we fulfill what our uh, parents uh, wanted to do. People who continue to come here believe that this is part of our land that was promised by God to Abraham and his sons after. And and since it's our and, and since this is a land that that's ours by uh, by promise from many many years ago, we feel it's our right to sit wherever we we haven't gone uh, technically into anybody's house and kicked them out. We came to a bare mountain, and since it's, it was available and it's part of our land, we we build our houses here to show that this is part of our land, just like Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Petah Tikva, or Herzliya. I, uh, I treat this land as any other part of the country. But the publicity has it that this is Arab land, occupied territory, belongs to someone else. You're troublemakers out here. It's government land. It did not belong to anybody. It was not registered to anybody. I don't know if you noticed, the caravans for the people before they build their houses are located on a rise opposite us. Mm -hmm. The homes are built on this side, and in between is a stretch of land that has nothing on it. That land is registered to an Arab. Nobody touches it. Nobody takes it. Nobody builds on it. So there is respect for... There is respect property. for his land. Yeah. But this land was government land, and this settlement leased it from the Israeli government for 49 years. I don't know what's going to be after 49 <laughs> years, but it's leased from the government. This is government land. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe in the time of the Jordanian administration, it was also government land, and the Jordanians administered it. Now the Israelis are administering it. But we didn't steal it, or take it away, or appropriate it, expropriate it, excuse me, from any Arab. Now, Joni, when we interviewed you before, you had a way of, of looking ahead. You felt antsy, you were uneasy. Uh, when I asked you before, if you saw war, you saw something uh, coming up and looming, you, you weren't totally positive. And, and uh, well, I'm asking again uh, to the prophetess, uh, is, what do you see up ahead? Is there going to be war? Well, maybe there is hope, but it's not immediate. I think that even in Israel, we're so divided amongst ourselves. And we're, we're exhausted from the 
propaganda. We're exhausted from the constant. We're just being worn down from, from all sides, and that's their best uh, weapon. weapon. Yeah. Their best defense is really just to keep, you know, it's like a little child with his parents. He wants something. He doesn't give up until he wears his parents' temper so thin that, by George, he either gets what he wants or he gets a slap. Mm. Or maybe that's the same thing the Arabs are going to end up doing. They're going to either get what they want, or in the end, they're going to get a slap they're not going to forget. Uh, Stuart and Joni, uh, many of our viewers would say there is going to be peace in Israel because the Bible says that. And then peace will come, uh, well, maybe when the Messiah comes. Did you see a uh, messianic age dawning now? There have been uh, many instances of uh, the messianic age being predicted in past gone centuries, and it hasn't come about. And I guess I'm too much of a modern skeptic to really expect it. It would be wonderful. Maybe that is the solution. Maybe that's the only solution. Well, it was a pleasure to visit uh, Anatote, a very old city. You may recall in the book of Jeremiah that uh, when, when Jerusalem was already under siege by uh, the Chaldeans and Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Jeremiah purchased a lot at Anatote. He had uh, a perfect faith that uh, God would restore this, what was then ancient land, to its original owners, the Israelites. Uh, that was in uh, 586 B.C., give or take, and... and uh, the original land grant goes back nearly a thousand years before that, some 21 centuries before the birth of Mohammed. Uh, God divides up what we are calling the West Bank in this way. I'm in uh, Joshua 21, the division of the land, and reading um, verse 9, And they gave out of the tribe of the children of Judah and out of the tribe of the children of Simeon these cities which are herein mentioned by name, and it lists a number of cities, and in verse 18 it says, Anatote with her suburbs, and Almon with her suburbs, four cities. All the cities of the children of Aaron the priests were 13 cities with their suburbs. So that was originally given uh, to the Israelites, to the Levites uh, specifically, and um, uh, is, <laughs> you know, we, we can't countermand God's will. That's what we mean by divine right. Uh, stopping them from building uh, suburbs uh, uh, and settlements because of our loan guarantees is simply sin. Uh, I don't understand why the Jews have no right to live in Judea and Samaria when I read this. Is there some place the Arabs can't live? <laughs> you see, Jews can live uh, 
in Israel proper, but not supposed to live in the West Bank. They certainly couldn't live in Syria or Jordan or Iraq or Iran or Libya or any of these closed societies with closed borders that are total dictatorships. No one in the world wants to live in those places. No one is ever incoming. I doubt if they have immigration offices. But in any case, the Jews couldn't live there and couldn't survive a day there. But the Arabs are allowed to live of course, in their own countries, in Israel, in America, in Europe, in Russia. I mean, there's no place they're, that they're not supposed to live. Is that fair? And they already have 22 nations of their own. Uh, it, it, you know, we've given these statistics before. They have 600 times the land for about 50 times the number of people as the Jews. Dividing Israel in the first place was the problem. It, it cannot be solved with a divided Israel. It cannot be solved. Uh, Get the products of this series and study it up. Uh, the videotapes is the best way to go if you have a machine. Uh, the uh, whole bunch of them, $99, and uh, including the beautiful music show, and uh, you will see it all. Uh, the music itself specifically is on cassette, and we offer that for $12. There's 10 songs. You've been hearing them as the uh, programs have gone by, including the title song, Israel by Divine Right. Or you can get the transcript, uh, every word that's spoken on all the programs, typed out for you, uh, $10 for the transcript of all 10 programs. And I think that's very fair. So the video or the music or the transcript, just tell us. And remember the gifts, folks. We, we really need it to keep going. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs>